Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and as we continue with the Jurassic Park series, I'm going to review a sequel to the highest grossing film of all time, Jurassic Park. Yeah, the movie that actually earned a lot of merchandising, filled with uh, lunch boxes, t-shirts, action figures, even video games too, and books, you name it. I'm going to be reviewing a film that's sort of a take on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but but in a different way, because it's still, you know, simply a Jurassic Park sequel. But it's not one of the greatest um, of them all, but it's still worth watching. It's called The Lost World Jurassic Park. But once again, we have some of the original teams from the original film. Stars Jeff Goldblum, Julianne Moore, Vanessa Lee Chester, Vince Vaughn, Pete Postlewaite, Alice Howard, Richard Attenborough, Pete Stomer, Harvey Jason, Richard Schiff, Thomas F. Duffley, Aranda Richards, Joseph Mazzello, Thomas Vosail Jr., Camilla Bell, and Robin Stash. It's written by David Cope, which is based on the novel by Michael Crichton, and it's directed by Steven Spielberg. The movie began set on a tropical island called Isla Solnar, where we meet a wealthy Bowman family who are spending vacation from a yachting cruise. We then saw a, their young daughter, Kathy, who's played by Camilla Bell, who wanders off and was attacked by a pack full of Gasophnifis, yeah, those tiny dinosaurs, but she wants up surviving after that. The incident allows Peter Lelo, who happens to be John Hammond's conniving nephew, who's played by Ellis Howard, had decided to gain control of his uncle's company in Gen, which is already in the severe financial crisis you know, after the events of Jurassic Park four years ago. Hammond, who's played by Richard Amberville, contacts Ian Malcolm, who's played by Jeff Goldblum, and explains that Isla Sonar is the island where the dinosaurs were engineered and neutered before being moved to the Isla Nublar, which that's where Jurassic Park was located. He also explains that after the park was shut down, Isla Sonar was abandoned during a hurricane and the dinosaurs were left to survive in the wild, where they have been explicably thriving. Hammond asked Malcolm to join the team that would travel to Isla Sonar to document the dinosaurs in order to rally public support against human interference on the island. Ian initially declines but uh, until he found out that his girlfriend Sarah Harding, who's played by Julianne Moore, is part of the team so he thought why not? So Ian meets his teammates Ed Carr, who's played by Richard Schiff, who's an equipment specialist and engineer, and Nick Van Oren, who's a video documentarian, who's played by Vince Vaughn. After arriving on the island, they found Sarah and discovered that Ian's daughter, Kelly, you know, the black daughter, who's played by Vanessa Lee Chester, has stowed away on their trailer, and they watched as the in-gen team of mercenaries, hunters, and Penelologist, that's led by Luflo, arrived to chase and capture several dinosaurs around. But meanwhile, the tracker and team leader Roland Tembro, who's played by Pete Pulsarate, yeah, who's one of the the big game hunter from Africa, and yep, he's the leader of the team, separates from the main group and tries to go after a male T Rex, yeah, Tyrannosaurus Rex. He decides to capture it by luring to, to the cries of its injured offspring, but that particular night, Ian's team sneak into the Ian Jim's camp and learn that the captured dinosaurs will be brought to San Diego as the main attraction of the newly proposed theme park. 
This prompts Nick and Sarah to free the caged dinosaurs, wreak havoc upon the camp, leaving the engine team to realize that they're not alone on the island. But during the commotion, Nick frees the infant T-Rex and takes it to the trailer to only find out that he has a broken leg. As the secure Kelly in the shelter with Eddie, a loud war had appeared from the T-Rex that's actually heard in the distance, and Ian realized that the infant's parents are searching for it to rush into the trailer, and as soon as the, he arrives, the infant's parents, the two adult T-Rexes, emerged on both sides of the trailer. Yeah, that was one of the scariest moments right there. And Ian, Sarah, and Nick rescues the infant. However, the two adult T-Rexes attack the trailer, pushing it over the edge of a nearby cliff. Yeah, and that's the scene where Sarah wants to fall in into the the glass window. Yeah, which is was starting to crack all the way around. Yeah, that was, and I know uh, Nick's his camera bag was about to fall right straight into the glass, so he was trying to to uh, capture it before it it starts to break. Yeah, I know that was very chilling right there. So. Uh, Eddie soon had arrived and managed to save the others, but as he tries to pull the trailer back over the edge of his you know, SUV by destroying the team's equipment around, Ian, Sarah, and Nick are found and pulled off of the clip by the Angen team. Yeah, because after that, you know, Eddie was already being eaten by the T-Rex alone. Along with Kelly, both of the group's communications equipment and vehicles were destroyed, so they team up to reach an old NGEN compound radio station on foot. So then the next night, they're being chased by two adult T-Rexes across the group's camp by tracking the scent of the T-Rex infant's blood that was on Sarah's shirt. A frightened group of the members noticed that the T-Rex, which causes... Uh, everyone to flee and, and panic. Yeah, and the female T-Rex was chasing the group to a waterfall cave which actually killed uh, the uh, that one guy. Yeah, the guy with the beard and glasses. Yeah, that was a very messed up scene because then you started seeing blood coming out of the waterfall. Yeah. But then, just when Nick was actually saying, IT'S COMING BACK! Suddenly, uh, Ian finally arrives when he went straight to the waterfall. <laughs> so anyway, the remains of the team flees through a tall grass savanna where the pack of velociraptors ambushed them completely. When Ian, Sarah, Nick, and Kelly arrive, Ian realizes that the velociraptors are nearby and they hurry towards the compound, which Nick runs ahead on the Ian Jen's worker village where he discovers a communication center and calls for rescue. Meanwhile, Ian, Sarah, and Kelly arrive at, a, at an attack filled by trios of velociraptors. The three of them manage to, to evade the raptors until a helicopter finally arrives to transport them off the island. Yeah, because they were actually in a, uh, an abandoned uh, gas station. And that's when we saw that really lousy scene where we saw Kelly actually using her gymnastics by knocking one of the Velociraptors right out of the park. And that had to be the most stupidest scene I've ever watched. And yes, I actually did laugh when I saw this in theaters. And yes, this is where uh, Ian actually says that line, You got cut off from the team? <laughs> yes, because, you know, she started taking gymnastics who... Yeah, as she explained to uh, Anne that particular day, you know, before they were arriving to the island, that, you know, she's she's always complaining about, you never use discipline on me or some sort of uh, situation. Well, you get the idea. But I got to say, I did laugh at that scene because it's so fucking ridiculous. And I admit it, it was a stupid scene. They later spotted an unconscious male T-Rex that's being prepared to transport it. Yeah, because this is what they wanted. 
So then the, the Free Fighters carry the T-Rex back to the mainland, but crashes into the dock when, when an investigation finds that the entire crew was dead you know, on the boat. So the guard opens the cargo hold, accidentally releasing the conscious T-Rex, which escapes into the city of San Diego and goes on a complete rampage. Yeah, and this was basically like a monster movie that, that Spielberg really wanted it to have because he had a different ending to the film. Uh, from what I saw in the behind the scenes. Th this is the one I actually did love for some reason because as ridiculous as it sounds I actually did enjoy the the San Diego scene right there. That's right because when the T-Rex had went on a rampage he actually went straight to a, a local family's suburban home where all of a sudden the T-Rex went inside their swimming pool and not only that but they just ate a dog once uh, the T-Rex uh, picked up the doghouse and oh that was really messed up and yes that that that's one of the scenes I that really got to me however one of my favorite scenes in the movie was when the T-Rex actually went into the city and it turns out to be as we speak downtown Burbank California yes because I actually went to see this movie at AMC Theaters in Burbank. This was back when they had the, the Burbank 14 that was located right next to Ben and & Jerry's and Fuddrockers as well as all the other restaurants where they used to play a lot of movies back then. Uh, it was They had 14 screens. That's where we went to go see the film at. Yeah, because we also saw Jurassic Park as well at the same theater. I never thought I would see that scene in the Lost World Jurassic Park because that had to be really strange to actually go see the same movie at the same city. There was a scene where the T-Rex was chasing uh, the entire group of people. You know, we see a girl actually screaming and yeah, she winds up moving backwards uh, on her car and she crashes another car and then suddenly we see uh, a group of people already running being chased by the T-Rex and we saw the T-Rex actually uh, chasing the bus yeah even knocks down the the light pole where it has the city sign that says Cedar the T-Rex actually knocks the the bus all the way straight to a local blockbuster video and that's where you start seeing like random posters of several uh, movies filled with all these actors yeah was, I thought that was pretty funny that they showed that. But then you actually saw the Japanese tourists uh, running for their lives. And then you can actually spot a cameo appearance by screenwriter himself, David Cope, who actually won all the way straight into the bookstore, which happens to be Super Crown at the time. And then he was already being eaten by the T-Rex. <laughs> I was like laughing as hell when I saw that scene. It really got to me. It really did because it felt like a monster movie right there. <laughs> but realizing that the T-Rex is luckily searching for its infant, Ian and Sarah learned that from Ludlow that the infant was captured and it's in a secured engine building. Yeah, they were trying to get the, the T-Rex to follow them. You know, since they, they were already um, trying to look for the, the infant. Actually, they're trying to, to keep the infant safe. They were in a gas station. Yeah, and that's when uh, <laughs> the T-Rex actually damaged the uh, the 76 sign. And that's where you saw it rolling around. <laughs> yeah, so they're trying to get it all the way into the, the engine building safely. So they retrieved the infant to use it to lure the adult back to the ship. But Lulo tries to intervene, but is trapped and cornered in the cargo by holding the adult T-Rex and mauled by the infant before the adult escaped again while Sarah tranquilized it and Ian closed the hold. So then after that, Ian, Sarah and Kelly watched you know, a live TV broadcast on CNN as the ship carries the adult and the infant T-Rex is escorted back to Isla Sonar which Hammond explains in the interview that the America and Costa Rica governments had agreed to declare the island uh, a nature preserves 
where they said that life will find a way, which then we saw the, the two adult T-Rexes with the infant together, along with a herd of Stegosauruses and Paradons uh, nearby. Yeah, and then the movie ends. And yeah, I have to admit, it's, it's not one of the greatest movies ever made, beyond the fact that this is a Jurassic Park film, but I, I'll give you this, it's worth watching. I mean, especially for its running time. I mean, yeah, maybe it could have done some work with some of the scenes that we had there, but I guess that's just probably what the film was going to go for. But I did like the cast. Um, I thought, once again, Jeff Goldblum was very good as playing uh, Ian Malcolm. I like one of those uh, lines that he had when, when he was, like, saying, once they were inside the island, yeah, but then there's going to be oohs and ahs, and then after that, it's going to be running and screaming. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I mean, this guy just cracks me up. Every time he comes up with all these uh, funny dialogue. Not to mention, uh, when he found out that Sarah was going to leave for five and six days, he says, you're going to come back in five and six pieces. <laughs> okay. So yeah, and I, I also like Julianne Moore as Sarah Harding. I, I thought she was very beautiful back then. And she still is now, but you know, I, I thought it worked pretty well for having Ian Malcolm had a girlfriend because at least now we know uh, Ian Malcolm background. I mean, after the first movie that we saw, you know, because he is of course a mathematician and a, a genius. And Vince Vaughn was actually very good too as the video documentarian. Yeah. And then coming from his uh, previous film, Swingers, which came out in 1996 with John Farrow, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that he was in a Jurassic Park movie. <laughs> you know, and he was good. I, I know both Vince Vaughn and Julianne Moore went on to do that, that terrible, horrible remake of, of Psycho in 1998, you know, where they both played different characters. Yeah, I know Vince Vaughn played Norman Bates. Totally miscast, if you ask me. But it was interesting that they were both in this movie compared to that terrible film. <laughs> but nevertheless, but let's get to the story. Vanessa Lee Chester. Okay, I'll give you this. I did not mind Ian Malcolm's daughter, Kelly. But unfortunately, there are times when she can be really annoying. And maybe, you know... There are certain scenes where I think I can deal with, but but that scene alone with the gymnastics was, was just totally unnecessary. They didn't need to put that scene in, but I guess they wanted to do it just for laughs, and that explains it. But on the other hand, I also love Pete Polsterweight, you know, and he was very good in this movie too, as uh, Roland Timbo. There was a deleted scene in the movie where he actually uh, beat the shit out of... Uh, at one of those guys who, who, who was going out to that waitress uh, while they were in the island. He actually beats the shit out of them. And the, the whole crew started carrying him up until suddenly, you know, he got hit in the nuts w by a pole saying that it was an accident. So I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, it was not in the movie, sadly, uh, when the movie came out in theaters. But they did play it on TV. Yeah, they also had a deleted scene involving... Uh, the introduction of, of Peter Lulow, who was played by Lewis Howard. In fact, he's the main villain of the film, no doubt about it. He wanted to take over for N. Jen by his uncle because you know, they were having financial problems. And that sucks. Although, it was great to see uh, Richard Annenborough back again as John Hammond, you know, despite the fact that he was only there for a while during the opening and, and the end credits. But at least, you know, we got to see some conversation with Ian Malcolm. And I, I like the conversations that they have with each other, you know. <laughs> I know. And I, I remember that, that line that he said, I'm not going to make those mistakes again. And then Ian actually says, no, but you're making new ones. <laughs> I, I like the, the exchange between the two. I thought it worked so well that I knew that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, later on. But yeah, I mean, still, 
I, I did enjoy the sequel for what it's worth. It's still, um, Spielberg did a good job directing this, and I like the look. You know, it had a dark feel to it compared to the, the first movie. I mean, it this time it's even more darker, and and the special effects that's done by uh, the Stan Winston team, yeah, and yeah, because they still had the animatronics that are so well made, and of course the uh, IOM that did the CGI effects uh, didn't look so bad at all. I mean, there there were scenes where we started seeing all the dinosaurs that's coming through the uh, the grass, yeah, because while the the whole crew was being chased, you know, they wound up actually grabbing all the way underneath. So I thought that was really interesting that they did that. And, yeah, because, or even the scene where um, one of the crew actually got attacked by Kamsafnafis. Yeah, those tiny dinosaurs that we saw, the ones that attacked uh, Kathy Bowman. They wound up attacking the guy, and, you know, he was trying to escape, but then he and then once again they keep coming back and and it, this time they attack them all the way until suddenly the blood starts to rush into the 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 river and that that was really messed up so I, I remember that scene um, but yeah and the dinosaurs didn't look so bad at all yes there were some times where I think some of the the special effects were a little cheesy Little, I, I mean, a little cheesy, mostly from the Velociraptors. Yeah, and of course with the, the gymnastics scene that I mentioned. Also, this was the first movie that introduced us to the new Universal Studios logo. Yeah, which which was used until 2012, you know, starting with the release of the Lorax. Yeah, which they introduced us to the new current Universal logo that we have now. But this one had a wonderful score that was done by Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, God rest his soul. Because he was a great uh, composer for several movies that he has done. Including the, the Rambo series. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, because I, I definitely remember that Universal logo very well. Not to mention, um, once again, we had a wonderful score by John Williams who did the first film Jurassic Park along with several other movies that he did on his resume but this one seems more uh, deeper and more uh, arousing you know compared to the, the Jurassic Park that we heard I think they did throw in uh, some echoes of the, the theme in the Lost World Jurassic Park but I guess you get the idea so it works, so I enjoy that. I have to admit there were a few that that had some problems, but I guess it's okay with me. You know, I, I I can live with that. It's better than than what we saw in the third movie that follows it up, which I'm going to get to after this. So, <laughs> but either way, um, it was a big hit at the box office during Memorial Day weekend. As he made uh, 618.6 million off its 73 million dollars budget that the movie had, so it worked, and it seemed like a different movie to the original Jurassic Park, and that's just what they were going to go for. Yeah. So, like I said, despite of its problems, I really did enjoy the Lost World Jurassic Park. So anyway, I give that film. Three and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.